Yeah. I think Don claimed that side. And yes, your yes, your mic. I'm going to invite you to center yourself. Um, so I'm, I will open with a prayer, and also for everybody here in the sanctuary, welcome to um, this event of University Presbyterian Church and the Soul Center. Um, and we welcome Edwin, and I'm going to introduce Edwin and um, w- to you in a little. But let us um, open with a prayer. Good and gracious God, we're so thankful to be gathered here on a Monday night. What beauty, what delight, when people gather knowing that we all are part of our human family, knowing that we all can make a difference in bringing people closer and tipping the world towards peace. Amen. Well, these are, it's not every night that you get two of your, um, pe- two people that you greatly admire from two different continents <laughs> in one room at one event. So, Don is chair of the, what are you, are you director of the Soul Center? Chair. Queen. Queen, Queen. Queen. Um, within the colonial context, we would prefer you not using such words, so I please apologize. be sensitive, Don. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I don't need to introduce Don to you. But Edwin, uh, as many of you has met Edwin, uh, he, he's, a, he's a man of many, many hats. If you, tr- if you ask Edwin what, uh, uh, what are you doing, it will take him about one day just to explain to you the, all the numerous things that he's involved in. But I think one of his main focuses is on Falmouth, which a group of University Presbyterian Church visited and especially his work with the youth. Uh, Fulmut in English means hope, full of, full of hope, hope. yeah, courage. full yes. of hope, courage, and um, it's a special place. Um, you will feel the spirituality of Fulmut when you visit it, um, because it, it is a retreat center, but also it became in later life the spiritual home of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and that's where he worshiped, and that's how we got to know Edwin as well. So that's another interesting part of Edwin's journey and that he became very close to the Archbishop, and he worked very closely with the Archbishop, uh, especially in later life. So we're going to kind of, um, and some of you have read Michael Battle's book, so, and, and some of you actually attended a, a Lenten study with Edwin earlier this year, and I asked Edwin, are you all going to do it again next year? And he said they're hoping to do so, and they're planning it. So if you're interested, let him know, um, because he's actually going to visit with Michael Battle afterwards. But another group of people I want to thank, and then I'm done, is the, the group from University Presbyterian Church that traveled to South Africa. You know, I, I know Americans do not really want to hear this, but it's a usually risky thing to take Americans to another country. <laughs> thank you. Wow, that's the closest I've ever gotten to our men in this congregation. <laughs> I want to thank you for your, um, your cultural... Um, sensitivity and your hospitality. You lift out the core love and acceptance and hospitality of this congregation as you traveled. That's why Edwin is back here. Another reason why I want to thank you is that you made it possible for us to fly Edwin to San Antonio and to pay him honorarium. Because Beth and I, our math was a little off and we overcharged you for the trip. So Edwin, this is we, for tonight, we're going to see if this was a good investment. The other, the, other, the other thing we could have done with that money, if we were a better accountants, we would have had a nice meal at a winery in South Africa with lots of wine and good food, or flying Edwin to San Antonio. <laughs> we will decide by the end of tonight. Thank you, Don. Oh, I have one. That's my own. Quite, yeah. Yes. So just a little bit of programmatic outlining. Um, We'll have about 45 minutes of conversation, and then Dries will have the microphone for if there are questions from everyone who's gathered here, which we hope so, because in just the short bit of time that I've had to speak with Reverend Otteson, I've already learned a great deal from some personal stories and um, his relationship with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So thank you. We're excited to partner from the Soul Center with UPC on this evening, and thank you for being here. Is this your fifth stop, you said? 
he's still walking. I was like, do you want a nap? <laughs> but he's still here with us. And um, you were speaking to me a little bit about some college students that you met with earlier today. And that seemed to really, um, as Dries mentioned earlier, your work, that's life-giving. I could see your face light up when you were talking about the conversations around you. And so I'm wondering if you would give us a little bit of personal background with how you came to this work, but also your relationship with Reverend uh, we start with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and and some of those personal elements in the in the formation of the work that you do now with young people. First of all, let me let me stand let me stand and say thank you thank you to all of you for your time here tonight for coming out here for being such wonderful guests in South Africa. And um, we, we joked about it then. We said, oh, I will come to San Antonio sometime. And it happened. It happened. You made it happen. You made it happen. So thank you, and a special thank you to Dries and Beth for your tremendous hospitality. Um, I, you know, I'm at home, and, and the two of them made a braai for me over lunchtime. So we, you call it a barbecue. Um, and that was so good, that was so good. So it's really good to be here. And then also thank you to you for being willing to, to be the, the channel tonight. Hmm? Yeah, so the first time I heard the Arch speak, or Archbishop Tutu, we just call him the Arch. So that's all I'll say, the Arch, the Arch. He was really an arch in many ways, an archway, an architect uh, also. Uh, so the first time I heard him speak was in the city hall in Cape Town, where um, I remember sitting somewhere in one of the cubicles, and, and as he was speaking, he was coming to the end of his speech, he, he raised his hands, both hands, and I could literally feel being lifted up by him, you know. And, and it was not just me, it was everyone else. So there was one, one really got the sense of the tremendous charisma um, of this person. And I'll, I'll, later on I'll speak about his spirituality. But it was, it was that that really uh, gave him the energy uh, for, for his work. So that was 85. Later that year, he, he handed over the, the position of General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. He handed over that to someone called Bayers Nodier. Now, now Bayers Nodier, I must explain, and I won't go on too long, he was, he was an Afrikaner, in a way like Dries, right? But he was a tall, I mean, he was, you know, a tall man. And he was a big man. And he was banned by the apartheid regime. And he took a stand against his own people, actually. And so Tutu walked into the room that day. And I was sitting. I was sitting there. And he said, "He said, we we black people, we are crazy." He says, "We are we are crazy. Look what I'm doing today. I'm handing over this very important church position to this white Afrikaner. We are, we are just crazy," he says. And then he stopped and he said, he said, actually, we are all black, all of us. Oh. Some of you just came out of the oven sooner than some of us. <laughs> and for Desmond Tutu to say something like that in 1985, in the heart of the worst repression of apartheid, at the tail end of the black consciousness movement was quite something. But only he could say it. He had the, I mean, he had won the Nobel Peace Prize 
in 84. So, so those two events I mentioned, um, I did not, I mean, I saw him, but I did not speak to him. In 1987 was the first time I was in a room alone with him. I was, I was an ordinant for the Anglican Church, or the Episcopal Church, as you call it here. And I had to be interviewed by my new bishop. He came in 1986. Sorry, I'm going on a bit long. You, you don't mind? I don't mind. Okay. So in 86, when he came to the Diocese of Cape Town, which is the, the area, I was actually in prison at the time. The regime had, had rounded us up and had held us, held us in prison. The, uh, that particular year, I think I was in prison for 71 days. And uh, my favorite prison story, I, I always say to people, I say, um, we were in single cells, and the, the security police would come <laughs> and interrogate us, okay? So they would call you out of your cell. Arison, come. We need to question you. And I went, I went up to this room, and there were these three big guys, you know, they were very threatening. They said, sit down. We, we want to ask you some questions. And I sat down, but, but what I did, I took my Bible with me. I had a Bible in the cell, so I took my Bible with me. And I sat down, and I said, I said, do you mind if I read something for you from the scriptures? And of course, because they, they, they call themselves Christians, they wouldn't say no. So I read the long text from the scriptures. Not Psalm 119, but it was a quite a long text. <laughs> and then when I finished, I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And again, they wouldn't say no. And so I prayed for them. I prayed for them. I prayed for their wives. I prayed for their children. I prayed for the grandchildren. And so on. Long prayer. And then I finished. I said, Amen. I said, okay, now you can ask me questions. And honestly, they only asked me one or two questions. Like, what is your mother's name? Irrelevant questions. So I, I left the room and I went down to my cell. And the other prisoners, of course, they had heard that I was called out of my cell. Because normally, uh, when you went to these interrogators, they, they would torture you. So they came to me. They said, are you okay? I said, yes. They said, did they torture you? I said, no, but I think I tortured them. <laughs> yeah. The faith was, was an important entry point uh, a way for me to engage with them on what they were doing. So apartheid couldn't, couldn't really last, really. I mean, you know. So anyway, so, my, so, so the first time I then, I was in a room with my new bishop. He, um, he saw that I was quite nervous. So as I walked into the room, he was sitting on his bed like a Buddha. And he, uh, he had a big pack of crisps with him. And he offered me some crisps. He said, do you want some? And I, I don't know if I, I don't think I took. Um, but I sat down and we had the most amazing conversation. And so by the next day, he said, yeah, Arison, I think you are holy enough to become a priest, you know. Um, and I then, um, I was ordained by him in 1992. So it means that at the end of this year, December 13, you, you can all pray for me. Because on that day, I will celebrate my 30th anniversary as an ordained priest, December 13. So yeah, so since then, I've been working with him. So let me stop there. Excellent. <laughs> it was a rather abrupt stop, but I'm ready. Um, we mentioned, when we were chatting a little bit earlier, I was talking to you about the theological roots of the arches um, activism, and I was wondering if you could share with us some of, of the, the theological, those veins or those themes that really resonated with him and fueled his passion, especially after imprisonment and tortures, and, and what yeah. are some of those themes? So, 
the arch um, studied, well, he was a school teacher. He left teaching and he became a, a priest. He studied for the priesthood in South Africa. He was a priest there for a short while. And then um, what, what was important perhaps for me to say about this is that he was actually raised by the monks. So there, there was a group of monks from, from England mainly. And they were from, from an order called the Community of the Resurrection. So, so he was really raised by them. That's a long story. We can, you can ask me about it, but, but, but it's important for me to say that. And they then invited him to go and study in, in London, at King's College in London, where he, where he studied. And his master's thesis was on Islam in West Africa. That's what, that for me was very interesting, that this was his master's thesis in the early 1960s. Of course, when he, when he came back home, after working for the World Council of Churches and so on, he came back home and there was a new wind blowing in South Africa. And it was really about, about something called black consciousness and black theology. And someone called Steve Biko. I don't know how many of you have heard of Steve Biko. But Biko was really the leader of the black conscience. Oh, you were there at that, that time, 75, yes. Uh, um, and and it, was, it, was, he was in the, it was in the middle of all of that. And so, and so it was really a reflection on what was happening uh, to black Christians in particular. I mean, how do you... This is a question that we grappled with while we were in prison. This is in the, I'm talking about 85 now. In 85, I was in prison on Christmas Day. And so the question was, how is it possible that a so-called Christian government can hold other Christians in prison on Christmas Day? How is that possible? So that was a theological reflection question, actually. And so, um, Desmond Tutu became the sort of embodiment of this, and actually one of the one of the leaders within the church. So, by '75, he became the dean of the cathedral in Johannesburg. Um, because you are the dean in Johannesburg, your your house, the deanery, was in the white area. I mean, apartheid had different group areas, and so he had to apply to live there, and he refused and went to live in Soweto. That's where he, he lived amongst the people in Soweto. And Biko challenged him even. Biko challenged the church. Biko said to the churches, be careful that you don't let people drink poison Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Cleanse the theology and the spirituality that has been handed over, that leads to, to the domination of one group over others, in spite of the fact that the Bible says that we've all been created in God's image. So you are, you are, you are spreading a false gospel, actually. And he called it poison. Um, and he says, you're going to die, you know, and spiritually you will die if you are going to be consuming this kind of false gospel all the time. And so that was, that was the roots of his theological thinking. There was also another stream called African theology. And so, so you had black theology, which was about suffering and so on. African theology about enculturation, about, you know, what do you do about, um, about the culture of people, you know? Uh, if if uh, <laughs> um, he said one day, he's, he told the story, he said, he said, when the missionaries came to South Africa, uh, they had the Bible and we had the land. And they said to us, Please close your eyes. Let us pray. We closed our eyes, and when we opened our eyes, they had the land and we had the Bible. 
And Tutu would always add a twist. He said, and you say, and actually we got the better deal. You know? Because it was actually the Bible. It was the Bible that we discovered was actually a book of liberation. God was on the side of the slaves. You know, God took sides. God took sides to begin with. I mean, many people think, oh, God is neutral. No, God is not neutral. God takes the sides of the slaves. And so there were many winds blowing. I mean, black theology, that feminist theology, as well as theology from this country. You know, the black theology from this country, the civil rights movement kind of theology, as well as Latin American liberation theology flying over, uh, over the ocean, you know, to us. Um, and, and of course, interestingly, in Asia, there was something called Min Jung theology as well. And we are so, of, of course, engaged with people in the Philippines, uh, South Korea, and, and so on and so forth. So there, there were all kinds of interesting streams of theology that came together that kind of shaped um, Tutu, Tutu's own theology. But I think the one thing I do want to say is that he was, he was very independent thinking. He was an independent thinker. And so he would often surprise us, actually, by... By, by saying to us, please, you, you must listen to that side also. Don't just, don't just listen to the one side. Listen to the other side as well, and so on. So anyway, that was some of the theological roots. The, maybe the last thing to say about that is that, and sort of this came more towards his years as archbishop, is he spoke about the, the philosophy of Ubuntu. Ubuntu which really just means uh, a person is a person through other persons. I am because you are. It spoke about interdependence. It speaks about interconnectedness. It speaks about, I mean, it's, it's, it's so Christian in that sense that it's about community and communion. Unity, a beloved community, and as he would always say, Jesus didn't say, Jesus, when, when, when the disciples went to Jesus and said, please teach us how to pray. He didn't say, okay, now pray, my Father who art in heaven. He didn't say that. He said, our Father. Our Father. Um, and, and I think that kind of sense of communalism was very strong uh, in his faith. And as I said, I'll come back to the, to the more daily practices. I'd love to do a little bit of a follow-up with regard to Biko and, and saying about the poison. And a lot of times, especially in recent events in the United States, we have talked about toxic Christian nationalism. And I'm wondering, for what was that cleansing process or what was that detoxifying process in the Sundays in fostering liberation and, and really speaking to and highlighting the preferential option for the poor that leaps off the page of the Bible? What were some of the practices or, or ways of being in community that that expressed? Yes. So you, you, you're leading me into the rabbit hole now. This is where I'm going to go now. Um, <laughs> So some of you were on the uh, on the um, Tutu Lenten series. So you close your ears because you're going to hear this again. Okay. Um, Michael Battle writes a book about the spiritual life of the Arch, and he and he uses three words, which is in the so-called mystical tradition. The three words he uses the word purgation, so it's to purge. Uh, the second word is illumination, sort of light shining. Uh, and the third word is union. So purgation, illumination, union. And, and the arch practiced that on a daily basis. And, and the way he did that, and, and I, I'm really encouraging, I mean, by saying what I'm saying, I'm really encouraging each one of you to think about um, how you would practice those three steps on a daily base, basis. Purgation, illumination, and union. Because what he did was to, was to celebrate the Eucharist every 
single day. And I'm talking about for at least almost 60 years, this is what he did. He, he would be on a plane somewhere, and he would ask for some a bread roll and some wine, and he would celebrate the Eucharist right there on the plane, on an airport. He was at an airport. He would do it. Because what the Eucharistic service does uh, is that it allows you at the beginning to confess your sins. It allows the purgation process to happen. And then, because of election, uh, three you know, different scripture readings, it allows you to be illuminated by God's word, actually. And then finally, with the actual bless, uh, blessing of the bread and, and of the wine, it, it leads to union with God. And so it's a daily practice. When Michael and I talk, we, 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 we say it's like a washing machine every day. You know, you clean, you cleanse, you cleanse, you cleanse. Because if you, if you become like him in a way, you realize that here's someone who is not only concerned about South Africa. He was concerned about the United States. He was concerned about Myanmar, Burma. He was concerned about Tibet, concerned about, about what's happening uh, the people in, in Rwanda, in Zimbabwe, in um, Canada, the, the first people, the indigenous people there, and so on and so forth. I can go on and on. But he was, he was truly concerned with the whole human family. I mean, he was so disciplined, actually, that he, he, he would have a list of people that he would pray for every day. His staff was actually very good. Uh, they would write down all the things that, that you know, or people that he should be praying for. Um, and then he also had these amazing relationships with the uh, uh, religious communities across the globe. You know, monks and nuns and so on across the globe. He would, he would always write to them and ask them, keep me in your prayers. So he was probably the most, one of the most prayed for people, actually, um, because he had these amazing relationships with these um, religious communities. Um, so, so those would be the kind of daily practices. Uh, there's, there's one more thing I need to say about him. And people don't know this. Desmond Tutu had up to six hours of silence per day. Per day. I mean, he would wake up quite early and had about two hours of silence in the morning already. But during the course of the day, he would break away for half an hour at a time and just be in complete silence. And, 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 and one of his staff members was, would say to me, his PA said, you know... He would go into the chapel and he would go and pray. President Obama would call and he would say, and, 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 and she would think, oh, maybe I should go and disturb him, you know, so that he can take the President Obama's call. And he would, she would go into the chapel and he would say to her, tell him I'm busy talking to God. I'll talk to him later on. Um, that's that's how, how disciplined he was. And how focused he was on his, on his prayer time, silent time, uh, daily silent time. Listening to this, first of all, six hours of silence. I wonder, <laughs> it's so counter-cultural in so many ways, especially with the digital access that we have nonstop. But what also spoke to me as you were relaying the, this, his discipline and, and these seasons of, that he had daily, not just the seasons of the church, but the seasons in his life of the day, was the emphasis on relationship. Relationship with global leaders of diverse traditions, relationship with the divine, and then relationships and the community that y'all were in. And I'm wondering how, how do, being so busy, how are these relationships formed and how are they fostered? Because sometimes, you know, we, we look out and we want to do so much in the world and we have this activism and the demand seems so in our face that there are things that seem that they could fall by the wayside and that might seem like relationship could do that. But I'm wondering how yeah. he honored that. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, about the very practical things he did, but I'm also going to say that, that um, your spiritual practice doesn't take time away from you. It actually gives you time. So, so you might feel that all these hours of silence, you know, what is it? But actually it gives you time. It gives you energy. Um, on a practical level, uh, when he was at Bishop's Court as Archbishop, he would say to us, uh, and this is very, this is his, his Archbishopness coming out. He's sort of, he's very English Bishopness coming out. He would say, I have tea at 11 o'clock to 11.30 every day when I'm here in Cape Town. And then I have tea at 4 o'clock to 4.30, high tea, every day, okay? And he would say to us as clergy, he would say, if you have a friend visiting you, feel free to bring that friend in those two half, an hour, half hours. And he would, I mean, he would be there. He would make himself available. People would say, can I have a quick photograph with you? And he would always be available for that, you know. Um, and, and he had the most amazing brain, actually, because he could remember things. He could meet people and then, you know, years later he would remember certain things. So he just had this gift of remembering people, but probably because he remembered them in his prayers. He, he, he deliberately wrote down their names and, and remembered them. So... So yes, his, his, his quiet times did not take him away from relationship, but actually, actually propelled him towards um, relationships. Uh, just the other day, um, I, I, went to visit, I went to visit a congregation, and I said to them, did, did the arch come and visit you here when he, when he was alive? And there's one person who was telling me the story in, in, in Afrikaans, in another language. He, he said, yes, he came to this area, and then he asked to go to the person who is both furthest from the center of the church and also who is one of the poorest people. And so they took him to a farm worker's house. And this is... This is I mean, this is him, first of all, requesting to go and visit someone. He was a, he was a visitor, hey? He was a visitor. He, he would visit all the time. He, I mean, if you were in hospital, he would come and visit you. People remember that today. You know, or he, he, people would say, when my dad was in hospital, he, came, he went to visit my dad. He actually, they remember that. And, and, and just by the way, he was, he, was very, he was a young child. He had both polio and TB. And he, was, and he was in hospital for two years uh, with TB. He, he was one of those people who, who almost shouldn't have survived. And it was the monks who found a hospital where he could go to, and these monks would visit him every Sunday afternoon. You know? Um, and we, we, I mean, in the faith community, we can do that. You know, we can care for one another. That's a little things we can do. Um, so he, that's, what he, that's what he did. Um, and so, I was going to say something else now, but, but I just remember that this is, this is the way he built up these, these relationships. Yeah, sorry, let me stop. You mentioned a little bit earlier in one of his studies when he was over in England, for one of his advanced studies, that he focused on Islam in West Africa in the 60s, and that was before a lot of the interfaith movements were happening, even globally. We had ecumenism, but not necessarily the interfaith. And so I'm wondering if you might speak a little bit to the insights that he brought to that, not only in those studies, but to just all the dialogues. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, you all know that towards the end of his life, his, his BFF, his best friend, was the Dalai Lama, right? Uh, you, you all know that. And, and I, I hope you all have a chance to see the movie Mission Joy. Um, it's, it's a movie about, it's, a, it's based on the book of joy. 
um, and it's about him and the Dalai Lama, sort of two naughty spiritual boys, you know, they like really naughty, really naughty if you see that. But in that, um, in that movie, he actually asks the Dalai Lama, he, he says, I would love to celebrate the Holy Eucharist with you. And he, and he celebrates the Holy Eucharist in the movie, and he gives him the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And the Dalai Lama receives it. And, and, and for me, you know, even though he is no longer physically with us, he's still challenging us. He's saying to us, you know, break down these walls. We built these walls. Break it down. Build a longer table. Hmm? And, and let, let everyone come and sit at the long table. That's, that was, is what he would be saying to us. Um, but, but the one thing, and I, I, I always say this to people in Cape Town in particular, I always say to them, the art had a very unique um, approach to interfaith um, activity. He would say, be the best Christian you can possibly be. You know, he would, he would every, almost every day he would wear his cassock and his pectoral cross and so on and so forth. So you can clearly see this is a Christian leader here. Be the best Christian you can be. Be the best Muslim you can possibly be. Be the best Jewish person you can possibly be. Be the best Hindu you could possibly be, you know. Um, and he also, <laughs> he also made, you know, he was, he was the chancellor of the University of the Western Cape for 25 years. And one of the most brilliant thinkers in South Africa was, his name is Jakes Gerbel. Jakes was the, was the, um, the vice chancellor. So the, the chancellor is the one who is just, is just really a kind of a chairperson of, of, the, of the council. And, and Jakes would be the administrative head of the university. Um, and Jakes was a Marxist. And so that he, Jakes said, uh, the arts committed to a once a week telephone call with me, at least half an hour, maybe longer. And, and so we, we, every week we had this telephone call. He's a Marxist. And he said, the arts would call him and say, uh, Jakes, this morning it's your time to pray. Uh, God even listens to you communists. <laughs> and, and, and Jakes wouldn't know what to do, but he said he would read a poem or he would do something um, but the arch was like that. He was, he was, he was always, he, was, he kind of joked about things sometimes, but it was, uh, his, his humor uh, was used as a way to bring people together, you know, and to affirm people's humanity. That was, that was how, not, not kind of biting humor that broke people down, but humor that, that brought people together. I mean, I can say much more, but I just, I just want to make the point that, that he, he, he was very concerned that we, that we celebrate the diversity. And not, and, and you know, the, the, in Parliament they decided eventually, let's have a minute of silence before everything. And they said, no, you can't hear the, the, what this one is saying, you can't hear what that one is saying, you can't, you have to actually learn to grow the diversity muscle. Hmm? That, it's a muscle that you must grow. It's a muscle. And, and, and in the same way that an athlete would have to practice and practice and practice and build the muscles, build the strength, we also have to, to, to build that muscle so that, so that we are able to, to respect uh, everyone's uh, approach to the divine. So that was his main main approach to, to interfaith. I've heard a few themes and I want to draw them together a little bit. Um, building on what you just said prior to this last theme about muscle and that was humor to build up and not to tear down. And not, you know, We have so much sarcasm in today's world which literally means to cut the flesh. Sarks is the Greek for flesh. And I'm wondering, we've talked a little bit about the, the, the practical or the pragmatic spiritual discipline of purgation, illumination, and union, but I feel like there's, a, there's a, another spiritual strand here, or maybe theological strands that are there that somehow interweave in a very loving way or compassionate way, challenge, humor, and a little bit of mischief. 
And I'm wondering if you might speak to, I mean, those are just some themes that have arisen, and I'm wondering if you might unpack some of that in your experiences with him, or if, if I'm steering in the wrong way, or if you think that that might be a vein of, of meaning there. I mean, look, he had a lot of fun with, uh, with the scriptures. Um, I remember him um, retelling the story, the, the creation story of Adam and Eve, you know, um, and, he, and he really played with the text. And I think it was, it was partly because he was so comfortable, so comfortable within himself, but also so comfortable with the text. Desmond Tutu would, in Johannesburg, when he was General Secretary of the World Council of, I mean, of the South African Council of Churches, um, he was in his office late at night reading the scriptures, reading the scriptures. And so he had, he had sort of fun you know, going through, going through the text, uh, playing with it, being playful, playfulness, actually. That's a, that's, you can add that to your, to your list as well. Um, not only mischievousness, but also playfulness. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, Jesus doesn't say, he, doesn't, he, for, he, does, he says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become like a child. Um, and he doesn't say that for nothing. Uh, you actually have to have the spirit of playfulness, uh, of of you know getting dirty in the mud, just you know not being too concerned about about all the other things. But you actually have to grow into into that sort of spiritual childhood. So yes, um, challenge certainly. He would he would challenge. Uh, evil, he would challenge um, injustice, he would challenge um, inequality, and, and he would make fun of it. I mean, I, I, they, there were so many occasions when, when he would he would be at a service and he would say, he would say, uh, I know, I know you security branch, you are here. I know you are here. So I want you please to write this down. Go and tell your, your bosses. Um, and he would, he would really, he would, he would and, and I, you could see some people in the audience being very uncomfortable, you know. Um, um, but yeah, and he would, he would be very, also, because he was, there were, were two things about him that was very important. The one was, was that he was a person who was rooted in the cross, now, one day I went into his office and there were papers lying around there and so on. And he said to me, please don't tell people about all these papers lying around my office. Tell them about the crucifix on my desk. And he had a huge crucifix on his desk. And he would simply gaze at this crucifix from behind his desk where he was sitting. And remember, remember he was a small man. As he, as, he, as he grew older and older, he became smaller and smaller. More like Gandhi. He's, he didn't have any hair, and he walked with a stick. So um, someone said to him one day, uh, Father, you must be careful. Uh, one of these days, people will call you 1-1 one, one instead of 2-2. Two, two. Hmm? <laughs> um, he, was, he was getting so small. One of his uh, other spiritual practices was that he would, he would sleep in a fetal position, you know, on his bed. He would sleep. Would sleep, and someone asked him, "Why does he sleep like that?" He says, "Well, because I feel held in in the womb by Mother God." Hmm? He, he 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 didn't have a problem calling God Mother. Um, so so he really was he. Maybe the word I can use tonight is he enjoyed God, and God enjoyed him. And the two of them were friends, you know, not just saying, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. They were really, truly friends. They were friends. And, and they enjoyed each other. Yeah. All right, Dries, that's our new, our new challenge, fun with scriptures. <laughs> that's right, more joy, more joy in that. We are actually at the 45-minute uh, marker, so I'm wondering if anyone would like to ask a question. Dries has a microphone. He's happy to. This is the brave soul who finished Michael Battle's work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
one, one of the things that impressed me in Michael Battles. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, one of the things that impressed me in Michael Battles' book was uh, the Archbishop's personal and physical bravery and in numerous events that were happening in South Africa. And I wonder if you'd comment on that. Uh, certainly, certainly. Thanks, thanks for the question, and, and congratulations on finishing the book. Uh, you need a special Ubuntu award, you know? Huh? We'll, we'll create some of that. Um, that's a really good question, I must say to you, because, in fact, we were just talking today about how, as Christians, we call ourselves the body of Christ. But we don't put our bodies where our mouths are. We don't, we don't even want to talk about our body. Um, and he, he literally flung his body into some situations. You know, someone was in danger, and he would go and take that person out of danger there. And I saw, of course, you know, I, I saw these things happening. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not an advocate for certain things. I'm a witness. I can tell you about these things. Um, and... And he believed in putting his, his body on the line. And so, one of the things that I, and I just speak a little bit about my own um, life, I, I was an activist, of course, uh, against apartheid. Um, and I was approached by some of my friends to even join the underground, yeah, join, join the underground. And I said, no because I wanted to pursue the non-violent um, path, the non-violent path against apartheid. I still, I still firmly believe in the non-violent path. In fact, I still firmly, I mean, I, you know, after many, many years, um, I was so convinced, particularly reading Martin Luther King Jr., that I would never possess a gun. I just won't do it. You know, it's a, one of those things, if I'm going to be in harm's way, God's angels will come and protect me. You know, it's one of those things... Uh, that, that I just made very, very firm decisions about. I'll put my body there to protect someone. Um, and so he would say to us, don't just talk about nonviolence. Use some adjectives. Talk about vigorous nonviolence. That's what he would say. And so, and so, literally, we would um, go and march and be on the street. And when we were stopped by the police, we would sit down, we'd start singing, and they would arrest us and drag us to their vans, you know, and put us in prison. Um, and, and we really had to put our, our bodies on the line because we knew that other people's bodies were being ripped apart. I mean, there were, there were people, close, people or close friends of mine, who received parcel bombs, and their bodies would be, would be ripped apart. You know, their arm would be ripped off. Um, and so the body of Christ, um, even today, the body of Christ is still being ripped apart, is still being trampled upon, you know, through the bombings and those kind of things that are happening in the world. And he, he put himself in harm's way in order to protect others. And so whenever someone is in danger, we, we must think of, of ways to put our bodies there. I mean, one of the interesting things, I remember I was, I was standing on a truck um, one day, this is in, in one of the townships, and I, I always kind of led the singing at these things and so on, and, and I, there was a big rally there, and there were, there were mainly black people, but then there were also some white people standing there, right? And the police started coming closer, there was a helicopter above us, and so on and so forth, and we said to people, let's start moving towards our houses. And then I said to the white people, I said, please form a line around this group of people. Because you know that if you stand here, 
the police won't attack them. And those white activists who were there, they did it. They did it. They formed that line around the, and people could go home and be safe. And then they could go back into their vehicles and go and go home as well. Um, and and it, 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 it worked, and it, it has always worked um, that there are some people who can actually put their, put their bodies uh, in harm's way in order to save others. And, and as the body of Christ, the body, hmm? we, 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 we put ourselves in the same way that Christ gave his body for us. We, we can do the same for the world, for the world's redemption. And tomorrow night, Edwin, we're going to speak a little bit more about that when we talk about um, specifically Israel, Palestine, and the nonviolent movement for mm. peace. Certainly. Any other questions? Both you and Don have spoken about uh, his sense of humor. And I was privileged to listen to him deliver a lecture in either 2011 or 12 at the Rondebosch United Church. And uh, as a visitor and uh, having grown up in the American church, I was struck by his interweaving of humor in a serious lecture plus in the Q&A. So is there more that you can say about whether he had that sense of humor from a childhood growing up and how it matured through the years uh, given what his struggles were. I'm just curious about that because that's one of the things that stood out to me when I witnessed that that night. So, so you were at the first Steve DeGrucci Memorial Lecture? I didn't know if it, I didn't know if it was the first or the second. But no, I, it was definitely that, the first Okay. because I planned it. Oh. Well, I was there that night. That was, that was the one I was at. You were there? Yes. Wow. I, I was with a, a friend that <coughs> Dries knows, Stephen Leach, who was a yes. young uh, associate pastor at St. Andrews yeah. uh, back then. No, um, just to say something about this, uh, there was a young um, professor, actually, a theological professor, Steve DeGrucci, um, who we were friends, actually. And he drowned in 2010. He drowned in um, in um, in the eastern part of South Africa in KwaZulu Natal. And a year later, um, I was with his dad, John de Grucci, who was the professor, of course, the kind of senior professor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer scholar. And I said to him, I said, John. Um, uh, is there going to be a De Grucci, Steve De Grucci Memorial Lecture? And then John said, oh, you know, they're talking about it. And, you know, I, uh, uh, academics, and I'm sorry there are many academics in this audience here, but, but they tend to talk a lot and not do anything. Hmm? Um, and I, I said, no, 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 no. I said, I said hold that bus right there. This lecture is going to happen. And on that day when we were sitting in his office, we set the date and we called the Archbishop immediately. And he agreed immediately he would, he would be the one. He would open this lecture series. And um, he came, and I think what I most remember about that night was the deep silence of this lecture. It was a deep, deep, Silence as he as he delivered this this lecture. Um, so your question is, um, how did he cultivate this this humor? I mean, I was of course very privileged to be in many 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 of the spaces where he actually used this this humor very effectively. I can't really answer the question about how it was cultivated. All I all I can say is that is that um, he was known from an, from an early um, age in his ministry, he was known for having this sense of humor and um, for using it 
um, in some of the most tense situations, actually. So when, when the situations really got very tense, he would, um, he would intervene and tell a story. And, and then the whole, the whole atmosphere would change. He was the kind of person who could, who could change the atmosphere in the, in the room very, very quickly. Um, and, and he called, I, I often ask myself the same question, to be honest. Um, like where does he get this from? My, my, my hunch is that um, it came out of his deep spirituality and his deep sense of joy. Um, and and, and it, it came very naturally. So, for example, when he, when he went to vote for the first time, you know, in 1994, and journalists came to ask him afterwards, uh, Archbishop, uh, tell us, how, how was it to vote for the first time? He said, oh, it was like falling in love. <laughs> now, who comes up with that? I mean, but it's such a beautiful expression, you know? Um... And, and yeah, I mean, he, he, his staff, he, he complained afterwards. He said, oh, my, my staff is not very nice to me. They, they, they say, um, Father, you don't have to tell us these stories. Just say number one or number seven or number eight, and we will know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, because, of course, he, was, he, he, he practiced it all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm the same in a way. I tell the same story over and over and over and over again. Um, but, but a good story, and he said it one day, he said, we all agree that a good story is worth retelling a thousand times. And, and it's true. There are some stories that you can just listen to over and over again. And it's, it's a good thing to practice, actually. So not, not to the same audience, trees. You can't tell in this, in this congregation. Uh, but, but as you, like in my case, as I was traveling, I was in, in Michigan, uh, Fort Wayne, Indianapolis, Nashville, now here. Um, you know, I, I can tell some of these stories. Um, and and in, in Indianapolis in particular, I had three classes on one day, you know. But I could tell these stories to, to the three different classes because one gets the sense that, I mean, why did Jesus tell so many stories? Hmm? Jesus knew. He knew that that these intellectual type sermons, whatever, is going to get you nowhere. You know, people will fall asleep. Um, in, in, in Cape Town, we have taxi drivers, and they drive really badly. And there's this one story of, of the taxi driver and, and the priest who both arrives in heaven. And, and uh, the taxi driver gets a huge mansion. And the priest... He's, he gets there and he gets this shack there somewhere in heaven, small little house. And he goes to complain to St. Peter. He says, I, you know, I prayed, I read the Bible, I preached. And St. Peter said to him, well, when he was driving his taxi, uh, well, no, sorry, when, 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 you were, when you were preaching, Everyone was sleeping. When he was driving, everyone was praying. <laughs> I found myself wondering that night whether or not, as a person of small stature, he might have developed a sense of humor uh, in dealing with bullies or others growing up. Well, he, he had to deal with bullies um, all the time. And I mean, the good thing about him, and, and here's the best part of it, actually, is that he could make fun of himself, you know? He, someone asked him, how did, how did you get the Nobel Peace Prize, you know? Uh, some, uh, some child said, uh, how did you get the Nobel Peace Prize? He said, well, first of all, you must have a big nose. <laughs> and then he must have a short surname, like Tutu, you know? <laughs> Um, he would make fun of himself all the time, you know, and that was a good quality uh, of, of, of tutu. So, and, and, and only when you can make fun of yourself, then it becomes so natural to be able to, you know, but it, it does come from a deep sense of joy within, within himself. Uh, 
Um, so I am the youth director here at UPC, so I work with like 11-year-old-ish to 18-ish year olds. Um, and I myself am 24, and so hearing you talk about the Ubuntu, Ubuntu, um, and that one of the things I try to stress to my students is the importance of being in community and how the people around us shape us to make us who we are. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you've seen that cultivated as a spiritual practice or um, just how you've seen that played out amongst young people. Well, thank you for that question and, and thank you for being even here tonight. Uh, I mean, I work, I work a lot with, with young people and it's always, yeah, it's, uh, it's the most, some of the most important ministries that we have are with the young people and with the children. Um, Tutu, of course, loved children. Um, and, and I remember at my, my, my children's school one evening, um, there was a rumor, I don't know why, why, where it came from, but it, it, it was a rumor because the arts lived quite close by. They said, oh, Bishop Tutu is going to come here tonight. Um, and for the for my own sins, I was standing outside. There, someone, and a little girl came up to me and said, "Are you Bishop Tutu?" <laughs> said, no. Um, so I think it's important that we that we cultivate the sense of of unity and interdependence and community in children from a young age. In fact, his own granddaughter who lives in Atlanta, Mungi Ngomani, Mungi has actually done some work on, she calls it Ubuntu circles, um, and how to develop those. And the, the, the important thing about developing these Ubuntu circles, I can I can refer you to some of her work at some point. Um, it is about um, learning to, to listen. That's the one, the one skill. Um, and learning to, to accept um, disagreement with the other. And, 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 and then also learning to forgive the, the other person. So those are skills that you can actually learn. And you can imagine if, if the child grows up in a house where that skill is not so well uh, practiced in the house and there's constant conflict um, there, how that child doesn't really um, know. And so the, the church can be a kind of a safe, well, two, two words I want to use. A safe space and a brave space that that allows the child to grow in in courageousness um, and learn those those sort of skills um, and I think it's best that we do it you know that we that we model it actually in the church so that so that when something like that happens that people can actually see that it's possible to, to deal with this. Um, I, one Sunday morning, I was, I was going to lead a service, and I went to the front, and I prepared some choruses, uh, but in different languages. It was, it was, you know, Zulu, Tosa, Latin, German. And it's some Teze music as well there. So, <laughs> as I was teaching this to the congregation, there was a man sitting there in the second row, and he, he, he put up his hand, he got up, and he said, I don't understand any of these languages. Uh, I, wh why must we sing this in, in this church, in English? It's an Anglican church. I said, sir, this, this will help you to understand the Catholicity of the church. Um, you know, it's not just the English. God doesn't speak English. God can, can listen to all these languages. There's no, there's no English language only in heaven. Um, and he was, he was upset. I could see he was upset. And, and I felt sorry for his wife. She was sitting next to him. He and he said, 
I'm going to leave. You know, and he left. And I said, fine. And we, the service continued. It was a beautiful service. And then at the end of the service, he came back to fetch her. And he was standing at the back. So as we, were, as we were processing out of the church, he was standing there. So I went to him. And I said to him, well, what, what happened this morning? And he said, no, I'm sorry. I just want to apologize. And so on. I said, no, it's no problem. I can understand people are feeling good on some days. Um, and, I, and I spoke to him. But what happened was that the rest of the congregation, A, they saw that I, I stood up to him at the beginning. But B, they saw that I was willing to talk to him and engage with him as a human being. That's the most important part of Ubuntu. The, the, the most important part of Ubuntu is about recognizing the humanity of the other. You know, even if I disagree with you, I still recognize your humanity. I still say that you have God's breath in you. Not that I have 100% and you have 70%. That one I see. No, nothing like that. We all have God's breath in us, and Tutu would say, you must bow to one another. Hmm? You must bow to one another, because you must recognize that this person has God's breath in him or her. Hmm? That's how you grow Ubuntu. And Edwin, I think it's the very fact that you can come into our house and be our guest. In, within a South African context, that a black man can come into a white person's house and absolutely. yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and the Archbishop did a lot of that work in South Africa that recon brought about such reconciliation. You know, people don't realize today, but he was actually hated by many people. You know, people think, oh, he was so loved by everyone. No. Um, when he, was, when he was became bishop, even in the town where I live, People were to go and form their own Church of England in South Africa. They didn't want him as, I'm not going to have this communist as my, as my bishop, you know. Um, and and, and he, he went the extra mile often. Um, there were some parishes in Johannesburg who told me, they said when he became bishop of Johannesburg, they'd be busy with a church council meeting. And then the next thing they see, the door opening, and here the archbishop, the bishop would walk in into their meeting. He made a special effort. He knew that, that, that there were people who were grumbling about him. So he made a very, he actually went the extra mile to build uh, relationships with those who disagreed with him, those who did not like him. Um, and, and that's why people today, they can speak about, about him in, with such fondness because they, they remember that he actually he actually went the extra mile. I would go in, in this town, Hermanus, where I live now. Some of you, I remember when, when we were there, you said Hermanas and Hermanos. Hmm? I, I, I remember that. Um, you know, it was incredible, actually. You, you, you couldn't really walk in the mall because you were stopped by every other person to greet him, to say thank you to him, to take a photograph with him. Or oh, you go into a restaurant and there would be people coming to us all the time, you know. Uh, so people really loved him at the end. But uh, if we talk about this, the 80s and the 70s, no. I can tell you now, uh, he really went through a hard time. And it was only later on, after the end of apartheid, that people began to say, oh, thank God for Bishop Tutu. <laughs> Bishop Tutu actually helped us uh, to get out of this, this mud that we were, we were spinning our wheels in this, in this mud. And he actually helped to to carry us out. And this is the thing I want to say about him. He was always there. You know, when I was born, Bishop Dudu was there. Um, he, was, he was there all the time. And Mandela was in prison. Biko was killed. But who was there? Desmond Tutu. But guess what? The minute Mandela was released, Tutu said, I'm now stepping back. The leaders are, are, are here, you know. And, 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 I, and I think it was so wise of him because actually it helped him to criticize them. When, when, they, when they needed to be criticized, he was the first one. He, said, he was sort of an, an equal opportunity critic. Hmm? He, would, he would criticize the apartheid regime, but he would also criticize the new regime when they went off the rails. 
Um, and that was very useful to then have a Desmond Tutu. He, 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 he did not, I mean, everyone knew where he stood, but he never sort of took a party political stand, you know. He was, he was always willing to say, um, I must create enough distance so that I'm able to, to criticize even, even people who look like me, even people I would have voted for. But you must be able to even criticize them. And that, I think the church must learn that. We must learn, and, and at the end of the day, do not put your trust in princes. The Psalms would say, do not put your trust in princes. Put your trust in God. Uh, put your trust in, in your own ability, your own agency, to be able to, to make things happen. At the end of the day, I mean, I, I, I can't say enough. I mean, I know tomorrow's your, your election, you will vote, and I want you to vote. Please go and vote. You know, um, but, but at the end of the day, hold your leaders accountable. Hold them accountable. Um, and, and use the agency that you have in the civil society to be able to effect the changes that need to be made. You have power. The people have power. Use it. Was the arch in prison? Uh, he, uh, in a way, he became untouchable. He was, he was, he was only arrested every now and then, and then released almost immediately. His life was in danger, by the way. I mean, there was one particular story where the army drove him and Peter Story, the, he was the Methodist leader, into the bush. And, and they were told to raise their hands. They were going to be, the, the army raised their, their rifles. And after a while, they dropped it again. And, uh, and, and they told the two of them, get into the car, go. So they were, dri they were driving off to Johannesburg. Peter Story says, he says, we, 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 we thought we were going to die that day. And then he says, Tutu was driving. Um... And as they drove, he saw Tutu's hands were in the air and he was thanking God. <laughs> he said, I had to grab the steering wheel because I, I didn't want to get killed again, you know, um, on the same day. So his life was often in danger, but, but, you know, thanks to the international community, thanks to the church, the global church, thanks to all of these, these groups, Tutu became really, at one some point, he became untouchable. They knew, the regime knew. If you touch Tutu, there will be sanctions tomorrow. You know, the, the money flow from the IMF and the World Bank would stop immediately. So there was no way they would, they would touch him. I mean, they could touch us, younger activists, but they couldn't touch, touch him. Sorry. I want to thank you very much for your comments, and specifically for tying in our minds Steve Biko, his horrific death, uh, the way they try to teach people by exhibiting him, uh, and you tied that to the other African theologies. And I think for me that was very important for you to do uh, because a lot of times we think of South Africa as isolated. And meanwhile, the third world theologies tried to unite the liberation theology here, the liberation theology in Latin America, and the liberation theology there. Um, the question that I have for you is this. Do you see the thread continue of the lasting, uh, the, the lasting um, influence that the Steve Biko, his life in particular, and Bishop Tutu, uh, because I know that when he came straight to a meeting that we brought him to uh, Washington, D.C., the, uh, 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 the Black Pastors Association, we brought him here straight from jail. And he was very protected then, and he was very not healthy uh, because of the torture and so on. Uh, and I always wonder, the influence today, do you continue to see that threat of, of influence of the Steve Bicos, the Alan Bosacks, uh, the um, 
uh, uh, Bishop Tutu, uh, does it continue that thread of theology of thinking of influence, and especially in the young people? No, thank you. That's, thanks for that. That's a good question also. Um, just last week, uh, another one of our priests um, died. His name is Albert Nolan. Uh, he was a Catholic priest, Dominican, and um, and of course, when when these giants go, I mean, Albert Nolan was a giant. I mean, he was actually Albert Nolan was a white South African, but we would have a black theological colloquium, and Albert would be a speaker at the black theological colloquium. You know. Now, that gives you an impression of, of who this person is. But I, I can say much more about Nolan. Um, but Nolan believed that every person, every person who talks about God, who asks questions about God, is a theologian. Okay? Every person is a theologian. The minute, you, the minute you start talking about God, and you ask questions about God, you're a theologian. You're doing the work of theology, actually. Um, I think sadly, with the demise of apartheid, we actually um, began to lose some of that reflection. Because I think it was more than a practical issue of how do we rebuild the society after 350 years of colonialism and apartheid. You know, we had to now begin to rebuild the society. So um, all I can tell you now is that it's, it's restarting. Um, I'll speak tomorrow night about, about Palestine, but, but uh, we had, in, in 1985, we had something called the Kairos document, and the Palestinians, um, in the year 2009, launched their own Palestinian Kairos document, and I remember they said to us, because, because I went in August that year to, to Bethlehem, and then I went again in December, and um, they said... You, South Africans, you inspire us. And I said to them, actually, it's reciprocal. You also inspire, you re-inspire us. And people are again beginning to think about what theology, the role of theology and the theological reflection is. Once again, to take it out of these uh, ivory towers and these big words, you know, Theologians love these big words, but it means nothing. It really means nothing. Uh, it is, it is when, when human beings are able to grasp the height and the depth of the love of God. If you're, if you're able to grasp that and you're able to, to love both God and love your neighbor as you love yourself, and hold it all together. If you're able to do that, then you're doing the work of theology. Um, and so, so the good news now is that it's people are. Be, I mean, I've done. Uh, we've done what we call contextual Bible study with young people, and it's brilliant. I mean, these young people, the the things that they that they come up with, and the the thoughts that. And, and, and after the end of a weekend with them, they would say. We never thought we could read the Bible in this way. You know, the Bible suddenly became alive to them. Suddenly. No longer a dead book. It's actually, wow, I can actually ask these questions um, and engage with the text. You know, so we always say to them, not only do you read the Bible, the Bible also reads you. Hmm? Uh, there's, a, there's a dynamic interaction between um, and and and... There's a, there's a mathematical phrase, um, text minus context equals pretext. Hmm? Text minus context equals pretext. Take the context out and you'll get to nothing. You know? So Jesus was here in a very specific context. So the Bible, the biblical books, the New Testament books were written in very specific contexts. It was written as a letter to some people here and a letter to other people there. It was meant for them. 2,000 years later, we're still reading it. And we have to understand, first of all, that context. And then we have to say, if St. Paul's were writing to the people in San Antonio today, what would he be saying to us? 
and that's the kind of prophetic imagination that we need to develop in order to build up our faith. I, um, I'm getting worried the, the red wine is getting warm. Huh? <laughs> No, 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 we must go. We, we can speak till midnight. But, but bring, bring the red wine in the meantime. Um, I'm wondering, uh, did he have a family? Did he marry? Did he have children? A Bishop Tutu? Yes, 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 yes. He um, is married to Mama Leia, to Leia, L-E-A-H. Uh, they were married for almost 60 years by the time he passed away. And they have a son, Trevor. So Trevor is named after Trevor Huddleston, the priest who, who, who raised him actually as a monk. So, so, so the firstborn was named after Trevor Huddleston. And then th three girls, Tan Tandi, Tandeka, um, Nontombi or Naomi. And she's in Atlanta, actually. And the, the, the last one is Mpoh. And Mpoh is in the Netherlands. Mpoh is, um, is, a, is a gay, openly gay priest. She's married. And um, this has caused a huge amount of pain for the arch. I mean, the arch, the arch you know, he was so faithful to the church. and. He, my daughter's getting married. I must go to the, to the ceremony. And just by being at the ceremony, he was able to bless their, their, their ceremony, you know, their, their marriage. Um, but it, it continues to, to be a pain, I think, in, in, in the church that we do not want to accept everyone as equal, everyone as, as having the breath of God in them. We do not want to do that. Um, and, and the arch was very consistent in, in everything. You, you would always say, freedom is indivisible. Justice is indivisible. Uh, human rights have no borders. Um, so if you are going to be concerned about racism, you must also be concerned about sexism. You must also be concerned about patriarchy. You must also be concerned about homophobia uh, and about xenophobia and so on. He was very, very, very consistent across uh, all these challenges that society um, are facing. So, so in a way, the children, some of the children at least, continue to, uh, I mean, two of them, both Naomi in, in Atlanta and Paul, they are both priests. And so they, in, to some extent, can continue uh, his legacy even, you know, better than I can, certainly, because they were so close to him. Um, so, yes, he, he's, his family... And, and of course, some of us, we're not biological sons and daughters, but of course, we were very close to him. So we were, we were his other sons and daughters. Yes, thank you so much. Can we please express our gratitude to Reverend Ar Arson? And I'm wondering, not to do a preview of tomorrow night, but I'm wondering if maybe you would just leave us with a few words. We have six minutes. Um, another thing that, or, or kind of maybe a category that I've been thinking of as you've been speaking on these amazing questions are the diversity of strategies of resistance that have bubbled forth from his spiritual life and from his profound attunement to God and to the human to the divine and the human in people and in this world of ours. And I loved when you were talking about like vigorous nonviolence, using an adjective. Um, I wonder if you think a little, just a little bit more about biblical, reading the biblical in a nonviolent way. You alluded to that with the text, context, and pretext, but the Bible has so often been used as a weapon. And what does nonviolent biblical interpretation look like, and where can that take us? Yeah, Nothing you. too big. Thank you for that. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a question. I will. I at midnight. I will wake up and say, Oh, what does it mean? <laughs> yes. So we we all know that that Christ was born into a very violent world 
as a baby, his life was in danger, um, and many children were killed, hmm? um, even, even as a baby, and he became a refugee in Egypt. So he understood the kind of violence um, that was going to be, to be done to his body and to other people's bodies. And that was the context, and it was, it, was, it was about empire, actually. It was the empire. The empire strikes back, you know? They, they always, the empire always wants to assert itself. In this case, it was the Roman Empire, but there's a long uh, story of the, you know, the Syrians and the Persians and the Babylonians and so on. So you can read the whole Bible just through the lens of, of empire, and you'll see what happens and so Jesus comes and he makes himself vulnerable. As a young baby, first of all, he's, his own body was. But then he, he ultimately offers his, his body. And, and we, we talk about the redemptive violence. But it's, it's, it's violence in, done to him in order that we may receive salvation. Um, and, and he started this nonviolent movement. Um, so when, uh, when he was arrested, you know, this one Peter wants to cut off the ear of the... <laughs> he said, no, 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 that's not my way. I, I, could, I could summon the armies if I wanted to. The host, the, you know, the Old Testament speaks about the Lord of hosts. I could do that. But that's not, that's not the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to offer my, myself. Um, and, and when we celebrate um, Holy Week and Good Friday and so on, we talk about the Passion, the Passion, Passion Week. Um, and so he offers himself um, on the cross for us. And he overcomes the violence of the cross through his resurrection. Becomes the first fruit of those who sleep. Uh, so he, he shows us, he gives us the example of what can happen. And so um, someone asked um, a peace activist once, you know, tell us the, the difference between between war and, and peace. And the person said, um, war is, is dramatic. Hmm? You bomb and you, 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 know, you can see what just happened in Ukraine now as well. Um, it is destructive and dramatic and so on. Peace is when a million people light little candles. Hmm? And even if some people want to blow out the candles, the, we continue to just light those candles. Um, and at the end of the day, it will, it, will, it will bring even the most violent um, characters uh, to a standstill. I say this again because I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a witness of this. <laughs> we were in prison in the 80s, and the people in South Africa decided on one action every Wednesday evening. Every Wednesday evening. At 9 o'clock. Every house was dark in South Africa. As many as possible. And all they would do is light a candle in one of the windows in, in every house. And we knew that the, the police could not arrest every single one who did that. And through simple actions like that, we were able to bring down the regime. Um, those who are for peace are in the majority. We know that. We know that those who are for violence and destruction and war and inequality are actually in the minority. 
They only act as if they are in the majority. But we who are in the, major in the majority, those of us who are, we, we, need to, we need to unite. And we need to, to say to, to war, you will not have the last word. We need to say to violence, you will not have the last word. Peace, reconciliation, justice, uh, compassion, unity, truth, always have the last word. That's the good news. And that's what Tutu taught us. And it's that hope that we hold on to. Thank you. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, tomorrow night, same time, 6.30, here in the sanctuary, we'll continue the conversation, especially focusing on the nonviolent movement, uh, peace, and uh, how s the situation in South Africa and the process we went through with peace and reconciliation relates to Israel-Palestine. Thank you.